Bibles back to Exodus chapter 20. As we come now to the seventh of the Ten Commands. The Decalogue, God's Ten Words. Our title for this evening's message is Sexual Purity in an Impure Age. Sexual Purity in an Impure Age. If you know the book of Genesis, I was tempted to use a Another title I thought about at least, or a subtitle, would be Learning to be Joseph's in an Age of Judah's and Tamar's. That contrast there that is so striking in Genesis 38 and 39, Joseph's purity in spite of, in the midst of Potiphar's daily seductions, and yet Judah and Tamar could not resist themselves one chapter earlier. Sexual purity in an impure age. Why are we doing this series on the Ten Commandments? It's actually something we did a few years back as a church and decided it's worth revisiting. And I don't think it's hard to see why, church family, the modern church badly needs to recover a strong Christian ethic. And it's only going to come from a high view of God's law. Think about it. Last time we looked at the Sixth Commandment, you shall not murder Is it any surprise that churches today who aren't being taught God's law and don't understand their Old Testaments and don't uh, prize and uh, treasure and memorize and can't even list the Ten Commandments, is it any surprise then that churches have become so weak and soft on matters related to Sixth Commandment, such as abortion or suicide or euthanasia? You see, beloved, if God's Word is the final authority on everything to which it speaks, The implications are enormous. If Scripture is king, that means God's word should rule in our personal and family and church issues. It also means that Scripture has much to say about national and political and governmental issues because the Bible talks about that as well. And in fact, the Bible has quite a bit of truth that applies to medical and scientific and psychiatric and psychological and sociological issues today. If we let the word of God speak, if we have ears to hear, if we take time to listen and to examine and to study and ground ourselves in biblical ethics. We live in such a polarized, divided society, whether here in South Africa or in the U.S. and around the Western world. Let's be clear, friends. The deepest division is not between right and left. It's between right and wrong. That's where the division lies. And when the right way, God's word and God's law is followed, it brings great, le- great blessing on a life, on a home, on a church, on a community, and on a whole nation, and even continent. Remember the summary that we learned from the Lord Jesus in Matthew 22 and in the Gospels in a few places. The two tables of the commandments are about learning to love God vertically, wholeheartedly, the first four commandments. And the last six commandments, known as the second table, is about how to love others selflessly, our neighbor as ourself. And and, and think about it. The fifth commandment we saw two sermons ago, if we love God, we'll love his authorities that he puts over us. And furthermore, last time, the sixth commandment, if we love God, we'll love the lives of those who are made in his image. And now in the seventh commandment tonight, we realize if we love God, we will love the spouse he has given us or or will give us one day. Or even in some ways, those who are widowed as they reflect on the spouse that God had given them. In fact, we'll do all we can to protect marriage in the Christian church. We're about to see tonight, brothers and sisters, how God's law shines its light and puts its finger upon every aspect of our lives. Nothing is off limits. All is uncovered, laid bare before the gaze of God, even our bedrooms. That's right, the seventh commandment dives right into the most private part of our homes and our hearts, into the secrecy of your sexuality, your romantic desires, your most intimate moments. In fact, there's a whole book of the Bible. We studied that a couple of, uh, two or three years ago, and I did a whole series uh, through Song of Solomon, the book about wise loving and wise romance. But 
That book is only to be expected when earlier in Scripture we have the summary in this brief seventh commandment. In fact, from Genesis, in the opening two chapters of our Bibles, on day six, God establishes marriage before he ordains family or community or school or government or even the church. As Moeller puts it in his excellent book on the Ten Commandments, marriage is the little universe upon which every other human relationship depends. Every other. And that's why adultery undermines the entire family unit. It touches everything. It betrays children. It begets unwanted children, often uh, rarely to be desired by both parents. It betrays friends, church, community, co-workers, and it unravels a nation if it's allowed. Adultery starts a breakdown of order that threatens the entire society. How can we trust each other if we are willing to break our most intimate commitments? Then I can't trust you with anything if you'll cheapen that. Moeller goes on to say, a culture that embraces adultery accepts within itself a poison pill for every other relationship. 1850, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote an influential novel we were all required to read growing up in American schools called The Scarlet Letter. Set in colonial America, adultery then was seen as the unforgivable sin. Those caught in it were marked with a scarlet letter set apart from society because of their sin for the rest of their lives. That's not what the Bible actually teaches, but it is an illustration of how far our society has fallen and drifted today. We can't even imagine such a moral climate. It would be unthinkable for most people's consciences today. We have long ago lost any moral outrage against adultery. We've come to the place where a spokesman for Generation X recently stated, hey, We're the first generation in which adultery is now not an issue. We have so little expectation of monogamy or of faithfulness, adultery is just simply no big deal. Kathy Gallagher now has a special line of greeting cards for those involved in an adulterous affair. One card reads as follows. As we celebrate this holiday with our families, I will be thinking of you. You may be familiar with what went public a few years ago, online dating service known as Ashley Madison. Their slogan is, quote, life is short, have an affair. Targeting people, married or in a relationship. Founded in 2002, in the first 10 years or so, Ashley Madison already had 25 million paid subscribers in 35 countries around the world. The founder says the following, No one can show me a culture on the planet where infidelity doesn't happen. Infidelity was always there. Our our site fills a void in many married men and women's hearts. In fact, this is a site that reveals what Jesus said is already in the heart of man. Adulteries. We are an adulterous generation. We have institutionalized adultery on every front. From our legal system to our public figures to... Uh, Even pastors, prominent pastors in this uh, city can have an affair, can bounce between marriages and still have their big shiny face on a billboard and pack the church next Sunday. Our social media, our movies, our TV sitcoms, our novels, our workplaces, our billboards. An adulterous generation. Let's read this text and then pray. The seventh commandment, verse 14 reads, you shall not commit adultery. Our Father, you are holy. In your loving wisdom, in your infinite goodness, in your careful design for us, in your perfect pattern that you've laid out for human flourishing and for society according to the manufacturer, according to the designer's rules, according to your holy law, you have spelled out for us these ten fundamentals. Thank you, Father, for a church like this, even as Kyle and Nicole have even testified in their testimonies for faithful and pure marriages that have gone the distance and that have 
stood the test of time. We thank you for your word here, Lord. We pray that you would teach and instruct us tonight, correct us and confront us. Lord, by your spirit, may we not only understand it, but even as we learned this morning, may we delight in your yoke. May we learn of you and indeed see that your law is not uh, uh, harsh or restrictive, but in fact it is your, your yoke is easy, your burden is light, your law is liberating. In Jesus' name we ask this, Lord. Amen. Sexual purity in an impure age. I'm thankful for some good tools I've used over the years in this study, particularly uh, Ligon Duncan and also our own uh, David DeBrain, amongst others. Our outline tonight is the familiar pattern. First, what is forbidden in the seventh commandment, and then what is required. What is forbidden, and then what is required. Literally, in the Hebrew, the seventh commandment in verse uh, 14 there says, no adulterating, no whoring, you could say, no harloting. Like the sixth commandment we saw last time, it's a strong Negative in the Hebrew, it's unmistakably clear. There's nothing confusing or vague about it. No sexual violation of the marriage covenant ever under any circumstances, no matter how right it feels, no matter how unsatisfying you think your spouse may be. No adultery. It's so serious that, in fact, it had the same consequence as the sixth commandment in Jewish society. Leviticus chapter 20 and other places in the Old Testament we see, and even during the time of Christ, as you're familiar with the woman caught in adultery, death penalty was applied both for murder and adultery. It was a capital crime. Later in Jewish societies and some other traditional communities, they shifted to, instead of stoning the adulterer, burning or hanging them. But remember what Jesus taught. And we have to turn to Matthew 5, please, for a moment. Turn quickly over to Matthew 5. The law of Christ, as we talked about this morning, the superior law. Reinforcing, reapplying, and internalizing so much of God's law in the Old Testament now through the law of Christ. Because of the cross of Christ. Empowered by the spirit of Christ. Under the new covenant. What did Jesus say? about every one of us being adulterers, lest we think we point the finger at others and exempt and exonerate ourselves. After talking about murder in the previous verses, he turns now to Matthew 5, verse 27. You've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble... Tear it out and throw it from you, for it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Our Lord is abundantly clear, isn't he? All of us are to beware of and repent of heart adultery. We are all fornicators, harlots, whores at the heart even when we have lusted with our eyes. No wonder Job 31, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look upon a woman. That's why we encourage men in particular to learn to bounce your eyes. Don't let them land. Don't let sin take root. Flee temptation. Proverbs speaks so often about guard your heart. Fix your gaze. Run far away from her door. Jesus goes on here to challenge us in verse 29 and 30, which we just read, fight violently against lust. Attack the root sin. Deal radically with it. Make it very hard to sin next time when one eye is missing or one limb is missing, figuratively speaking here. Deal radically with sin and realize lust is the path to hell. This this sin is that powerful. Sexual lust, sexual addiction, sexual bondage is one of those sins that grabs you so tightly it will drag you straight to hell if you let it. I, I, I know we've talked as a, uh, I know, uh, pastoral staff, for example, uh, even recently. These sins, these sins of, of, of uh, murder, 
these sins of, of, of lust and adultery from the heart. When, when you read a lot of modern uh, Christian literature and even some biblical counseling literature, they, they leave out this aspect of how Christian assurance is conditional. And if you aren't dealing with this, at some point you're headed to hell and you prove you're not saved. Eternity is at stake. Not just a bunch of, oh, there's consequences, but once saved, always saved. No, if saved, always saved. Don't toy with lust. One of the most deadly sins. Eternity is at stake. And that ought to put a fire under young people and all of us for sexual purity. Let's give a few other applications here. You can turn back to Exodus 20. You shall not commit adultery. What is forbidden here? Where do we start with the applications? My goodness. Wayne Grudem's excellent text that I've been holding up to you. If you've been wanting this, I just want to remind you about the 10th commandment. <clears throat> uh, you can't have my book. That's called coveting. Uh, <laughs> um, but this is an excellent resource of applying. And when it comes to the 7th commandment, uh, Grudem's chapters on protecting marriage are part 5, 200 pages of the book. Applying it to marriage, applying it to birth control. What's morally wrong? What's acceptable? How about infertility, reproductive technology, and adoption? What does the Bible say about surrogate, motherhood, embryo adoption, in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination? The Bible talks about all these things in principle form. How about pornography? Why is it wrong? What are the harmful results? A whole chapter on divorce and remarriage. How about in the case of physical abuse? Can they be a church officer? How about homosexuality and transgenderism? Do the biblical passages about homosexuality still apply today? Can you be born gay? How do we evaluate the claims of people who are so-called transgender? What about sex change surgery? All of this working out of that one verse, which is a framework for all of biblical ethics and all of the Old Testament's uh, further teaching on the sacredness and the sanctity of marriage. And so in that same vein... Let's apply this to the forbidding of pornography. We're told that porn-related sites make up at least 60% of daily web traffic. Of internet users in the States, we're told, and I fear and I doubt it would be much different here in urban South Africa, those who use the internet, 40%, at least once a month, are visiting a porn site. But the number when you're dealing with men ages 18 to 34, soars to 70% of men in those ages at least once a month. Kids ages 8 to 16 who have internet access, 90% have viewed porn online. Average starting age, 11. A major survey shows that as much as 50% of clergy, Christian professing ministers of the gospel and pastors admit to viewing porn sites. Uh, do you understand, friends, our sex-saturated culture is not just breaking the seventh commandment. We're smashing it to pieces. Ligon Duncan points out three tap roots that feed pornography. You could say three secrets if you want to become a porn addict. First of all, be an idolater. Break the first commandment. Make sexual gratification your God. Bow down before it every chance you get. It's idolatry. The second taproot is secrecy. Love the darkness. Hide from the light. Believe the lies and the myths of anonymity. Avoid accountability. Idolatry, secrecy, and the third taproot that feeds pornography, isolation. Isolation from spouse, from godly friends, from true fellowship in the church. I ask you. Men, brothers in Christ tonight, what precautions are you taking? For starters, does your wife have unlimited access to every digital device in your possession? Your phone, your PC, whatever it might be. And if, if this is at all a snare for you, then do you avoid any internet use in private whatsoever? Make sure your laptop's open. You've got a window. Your door's open. It's always visible. The minute your wife comes in and you stop doing what you're doing, busted. Or at least highly suspicious. Honey, why the shifting? 
right when I walked in. As we know, human accountability will never take you further than divine accountability. The fear of the Lord is the key motive beneath it all. How are you avoiding all sexually explicit media? What a delight to hear of more than one household since last week and something DeBrain said, I think at the Q&A or just a passing comment, it wasn't even one of his sermons. And I've heard of a few families in the last week saying, ah, we don't need to watch that movie. Let's rather consider this movie. Or why don't we in fact read a book? Or you know what, let's rethink our music or entertainment habits. Flee sexual immorality, 1 Corinthians 6, 6 tells us. Maybe for you it's novels, it's, it's social media, it's, it's news adverts. I was trying this afternoon to listen to classical music uh, while uh, 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 Christians were enjoying fellowship in another part of my house and I had to do some final looking over of the sermon and you're just listening to YouTube classical music and they want to throw up some you know, uh, inappropriate images related to Bach. Where, where, do you, where do you get away from this junk? <laughs> Another application of what the seventh commandment forbids is immodesty. Antioch is blessed with beautiful women in this church. All the more reason that our sisters in Christ ought to be careful to wear anything too tight, too tiny, or too transparent. What message are you sending, ladies, to the men in this church with your clothing? Is it that you want to point to God and be respected as a godly woman? Or is it that you're available at the right price? 1 Timothy chapter 2 is quite clear. The Christian woman wants to adorn herself, not to create an attraction. Do you want your brothers in Christ to stumble or to progress in holiness? And fathers, it starts in our homes, right? Under our own roofs. When's the last time you stopped your daughter and said, my girl, you're not leaving the house wearing that outfit. I love you too much. And beloved, let's also apply the seventh commandment to premarital sex and the widely accepted practice nowadays of cohabitation. I regularly seem to meet people who've lived together for years, if not decades, and it's almost like, oh, marriage. Hey, good idea. Never thought about that. That's a new one, hey? No, it's God's invention. It's a divine institution. You neglect it at your peril. You ignore it to your own demise. How often have our new folk in the church, new believers, testified that after they got saved or restored to the Lord, it was because they were in a church willing to confront this culturally accepted common sin of our day. The Bible is clear. Any premarital sexual contact betrays your future spouse. Sexuality cannot be separated from the marriage covenant. There should be no sexual enjoyment outside of a covenant commitment. And the man shall leave his father and mother, Genesis 2.24, and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Covenant first, enjoyment after. Membership, then privileges. Vows, and then bedtime. Get that backwards, and you're perverted. You are twisting God's design, and you will incur his judgment. Sexual union is the seal, it's the bond of the marriage covenant. It is not a substitute for it. You take sex out of marriage, as the brain says, you rob a holy gift of God out of its place. You use it for simply one aspect, physical pleasure. And by the way, men, this would include self-stimulation, a favorite tool of Satan, a snare that has hung up godly men for decades of when they could have been useful for the Lord and they're still busy having solo sex in the face of a holy God. The brain continues, it then makes an idol out of physical pleasure, this sex outside of marriage. Once you've made an idol 
uh, merely out of the pleasure aspect, soon you have no end to the forms of perversions it could lead to, from adultery to fornication to incest to homosexuality, bestiality. Why not stop, why stop there? Uh, why not pedophilia and child abuse and rape and, and necrophilia and, and casual promiscuity? There is really no logical limit or end to how you can pervert a good thing once you take it out of its intended God-given place. He continues, once a sin gets a physical hook in you, the temptation is that much harder to overcome. No wonder Song of Solomon warns us, do not arouse or awaken love before it pleases. Three times, the theme of the whole book of Song of Solomon. Don't arouse desires that cannot be lawfully met. As one of my pastors used to say to us in varsity years, (laughs) if you're not planning to eat the cookies, biscuits as we would say here, if you're not planning to eat the biscuits, why are you turning on the oven? Don't create an itch you cannot scratch without sin. Proverbs often tells us not to take fire in one's bosom and and not to be burned and warns us about toying with physical sin, thinking we won't pay a price. The seventh commandment also, beloved, forbids unbiblical divorce, also rampant in our society, widely accepted in our no commitment age Jesus said that a divorce and then a remarriage for any other reason except adultery is an unbiblical one. And God does not regard that covenant as truly over. Matthew 5, Matthew 19. And therefore, God regards the next marriage as adultery and not as a new marriage. Sure, there's forgiveness. There is restoration to those who confess unbiblical divorce. But no Christian should knowingly pursue the way the world regularly ends marriages, divorces, and remarries freely. This no-fault divorce age. Malachi chapter 2 is very clear. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. And yet I know of a Christian counselor, last I checked a few years ago, in Johannesburg, very popular, listens to your troubled marriage, encourages spouses to reconcile. But hey, if it doesn't work, well then, he says, let's help you divorce as peaceably as possible. You know, try God's law, see if you can obey. If it doesn't work, we'll explore other unlawful, unbiblical options, whatever suits you. No. What do we say from this platform Every Antioch wedding, marriage done God's way, works every time. Another thing the seventh commandment forbids is depriving one another in the marriage. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is clear. He's shocking to the ancient culture. He gives the woman equal rights over her husband's body, not just him, over her body. Stop depriving and denying one another. We don't have time, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 5, in detail, warn about sexual purity in the church and amongst believers. There shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality. This is the will of God for you, even your sanctification. Michelle and I had a wonderful time a few years ago. I think there's a few of them still here tonight. And the Manash students went down to the beach and had a young uh, a Manash young adult Retreats, and we went through Conrad and Bayway's excellent book on sexual purity and had individual conversations with them. And what does it look like to stay pure, to repent where you failed, to receive the Lord's cleansing, to start new, a kind of secondary virginity, you might say, from here on, preserving yourself for your spouse. The Westminster Larger Catechism sums it up once more so well. What are the sins forbidden in the seventh commandment? Answer. The sins forbidden in the seventh commandment, besides the neglect of the duties required, which we're coming to in a minute, what's forbidden is adultery, fornication, rape, incest, sodomy, and all unnatural lusts, all unclean imaginations, thoughts, purposes, and affections, all corrupt and filthy communications, list or listing thereunto, even listening to them, wanton looks, impudent or light behavior, immodest apparel, Prohibiting of lawful and dispensing with unlawful marriages. Entangling vows of a single life. You think you're going to be some mighty monk. (laughs) Undue delay of marriage. Oh my, undue delay of marriage. (laughs) 
That's like a summary of modern Christianity. <laughs> Undue delay of marriage. Like, welcome to the modern age. What do we do? We wait as long as we can to get married. That is 21st century society. And the Puritans actually would rebuke and call people to repent of undue delay. It forbids having more wives or husbands than one at the same time. Unjust divorce or desertion. Idleness, gluttony, drunkenness, unchaste company. The, the Westminster Catechism is not done. It forbids lascivious songs, books, pictures. <laughs> this is way before Hollywood. Wow. Dancing, stage plays, all other provocations to or acts of uncleanness, either in ourselves or others. One of our members here told me recently that the school he went to here, a private school in Johannesburg, 10 years ago, basically had no transgender. And if anyone tried to, you were exiled and frowned on. 10 years later, as of this year, in grade 8 alone, there are 13 transgenders. You tell me we're not facing a Assault on marriage like our society has never seen. You saw the Western Cape, the government buildings last week, right? Lit up with the perverse, stolen rainbow from God and the perverse colors of the homosexual and transgender revolution. Shorter catechism in one sentence. What is forbidden in the seventh commandment? Answer, the seventh commandment forbids all unchaste thoughts, words, and actions. Heidelberg, so practical. You can hear the the heart of, a, of a, a, a Christian parent and of faithful pastors. Does God in this commandment, the seventh, forbid only such scandalous sins as adultery? Answer, we are temples of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, body and soul. And God wants both to be kept clean and holy. That is why God forbids all unchaste actions and looks and talk and thoughts or desires and whatever may incite Someone to those. Number two, we've seen what is forbidden. Now, beloved, what is required in the seventh commandment? More briefly, what is required? Remember, this is a pattern based on Jesus himself who summed up the Ten Commandments with two positives, even though eight of the commands are actually negative. So we have his permission and pattern to look for what's forbidden and required in each of the Ten Commandments. And he's teaching us here as believers to show covenant loyalty to God only so that we would show sexual loyalty to our spouse only, present or future. Remember the Old Testament teaches, the New Testament confirms marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. And loyalty in that relationship demands that we be sexually loyal to one another, husband to wife, wife to husband. And so across the Old and the New Testament... All sexual sin is defined in something that has become a foreign category today in this no commitment age we live in. But in the Bible, sexual sin was defined as covenant disloyalty, both vertical to God and horizontal to your present or future spouse. Remember, the first four commandments are all about exclusive loyalty to God. Worship only him in his way, not misusing his name and honoring his day. No wonder then that God wants us to, or rather, that God illustrates disloyalty to him through the writings of the prophets with the most graphic metaphor of all. He calls Israel a harlot, adulterous, whoring, whenever his people are unfaithful to him. They provoke his jealousy. Read the whole book of Hosea. Because a covenant requires commitment. And when we are disloyal, when we are unfaithful sexually to our partner, we violate that covenant in the deepest way it could be violated. In fact, so deeply, Jesus says, it becomes a legitimate biblical ground for severing the marriage covenant. If the spouse would so choose, though we would say in Christ, there should normally be forgiveness for the repentant harlot. And so God says your faithfulness in marriage to your partner is a picture of a faithful covenant relationship with me, the Lord says. And in Ephesians 5, that's the whole point, right? Marriage depicts this union between Christ and his church. And so fidelity in marriage is a mirror of our fidelity to God. No wonder there's such strong words against adultery and sexual morality and sexual impurity in Scripture. 
And it makes perfect sense in relation to God. Because immorality strikes deeply. And it betrays the picture of God's covenant. Someone said adultery stabs at the heart of his covenant with us. And the very heart of our marriage covenant with our spouse. It strikes at the very heart of trust and love and loyalty and affection and intimacy and unity. Remember Psalm 51, David's confession of his adultery with Bathsheba. Ultimately, who was it against? Not her, not her husband Uriah, not the nation of Israel he was called to lead as the king, not to all of his other wives, by the way. No, he says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, Lord. It was a betrayal and a disloyalty against God supremely. And if you have failed in this area, and as we know from the heart we all have, and perhaps even in your behavior, you have transgressed the law of God. Go to him, confess, use the language of Psalm 51. Take heart in the, the characters around the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, including a former uh, uh, adulterers and immoral. And, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified in the name and the spirit of our God. We look forward to next Sunday morning as we come to communion. We think about John 8 and that story of the woman caught in adultery. Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She says, no one, Lord. To which he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Christ died for gomers. Christ died for harlots and lawbreakers like us all. And his grace and forgiveness is not there to give us more room to sin, but to give us a fresh start to stop sinning. What shall we say? Shall we sin that grace may abound? May it never be. Romans 6. Starts with confession to God, confession to your spouse, anyone else that you may have betrayed. Another key positive application, what is required in the seventh commandment, embracing contentment. Embracing contentment. I like the way DeBrain puts it. Adultery, like so many sins, comes out of discontent, out of refusing to accept and be grateful for what God has given you. Who goes hunting for a restaurant when you've just eaten well? Who goes looking for a new car if you've just bought one that you like? Who goes looking for another companion, another lover, another soulmate if you are thankful and content with the one God has already given you? Ah, but that's the point. My spouse doesn't make me happy anymore, they say. I have a right to happiness. Oh, really? Really? Before you have a right to keep your vows you took before God and many witnesses publicly? You have a right, the Bible says, to seek the happiness of your spouse. And having done that, you have the obligation to grow and to learn, as Paul says in Philippians 4, Christian contentment. You cannot be content, Christian, and at the same time be contemplating betraying your spouse and betraying your God. Godliness with contentment is... Great gain. It's the finest of riches. That's the most affluent man or woman on the planet. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment, the brain concludes, is submitting to the portion God gives me. It is gladly accepting the slice God has cut out for me. Contentment is a light. Once it is switched on, the cockroaches of adultery and covetousness and every other form of sexual impurity starts to scatter and flee. Married couples, are you rejoicing in your spouse? Stop waiting for the day your spouse will be someone else. Pray for change, but give thanks for what is. Solomon tells us, Ecclesiastes 9, Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he's given you under the sun, all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life, and the labor which you perform under the sun. In the Hebrew, it's a very technical meaning. Ecclesiastes 9, as my father-in-law likes to put it, have fun with your hun under the sun. (laughs) Singles, rejoice in your mobility and and flexibility. Paul speaks at length in 1 Corinthians 7 about the single-mindedness that is a unique opportunity for you unless or until you are married. If you desire marriage, great. You've come to the right church. (laughs) Every Bible teaching church should be like that. Pray for it, aim for it, work towards it. But while you are doing something about your singleness, make sure you also do something with your singleness. Serve, 
Encourage, be hospitable, pour yourself out in the Lord's service. Here's a summary. We've seen what's forbidden, now we see what's required in the seventh commandment. What are the duties? As the Westminster Larger Catechism puts it so helpfully, so in such detail. Answer, the duties required in the seventh commandment are chastity in body, mind, affections, words, and behavior. And the preservation of it in ourselves and others. Watchfulness over the eyes and all of the senses. Temperance, keeping of chaste company. Modesty in apparel. Marriage by those that have not the gift of continency or celibacy. Conjugal love. Amazing. <laughs> they called it cohabitation. Wow, have things changed. They were commanding married people to make sure they cohabit. We live in a world where the, <laughs> the whole word means the opposite. Before you, people have actually gotten married. And then in closing, the Westminster Confession says it also, the seventh commandment also requires diligent labor in our callings. Wow. As you fulfill your vocation, you are helping protect marriage, whether as a husband and provider and breadwinner or a homemaker, a wife and a helper. It also means shunning all occasions of uncleanness and resisting any temptation thereunto. Or more briefly, in our catechism, as we use the shorter catechism, and you can probably see why now. If we use a larger one, it would be like three volumes. What is required in the seventh commandment? Answer. The seventh commandment requires the preserving of our own and our neighbor's chastity in heart, in speech, and in behavior. If we simply read the Proverbs more often, like, again, my father-in-law has modeled, and as we have sought to do at, at times as a family, and in my own practice at times, to read the proverb of the day. There's 31 Proverbs. There's about that many days in the month. You wonder, when do I talk about the birds and the bees with my kids? Well, if you're always reading through the Proverbs, as Dr. Mack told us long ago, guess what's going to come up when you get to Proverbs 5 and Proverbs 6 and Proverbs 7. Oh, in fact, Proverbs 2 and then some other Proverbs later on as well. And then once you are married and even if you don't have kids and for your own sexual purity, continuing to read, especially the warnings of Proverbs 5 and Proverbs 7 about the fatal attraction of, the, of, of adultery. I'll close with this. Michelle and I were at a memorable wedding reception. Turn to Hebrews 13 if you don't know this text. I read it at the beginning of every wedding here at Antioch. But this was one of our interns, a dear brother, down in a township a few hours away from here. And they asked me to share something at the reception. But clearly... As you may know, I think it's probably not that uncommon in some cultures and perhaps in some of um, township life. A lot of people who weren't invited to the ceremony and who weren't Christians knew there was a lot of good food and they showed up at the reception. And when it was my turn to go up, uh, it seemed like it took uh, an hour just for the music to be turned down so that they could actually hear me. And then there were still all these particularly unbelievers, sadly, in, in a country like this. They, most of them probably claimed to be Christians, but they were already drunk and, uh, and wild and raucous. And this couple was dear to me, and I couldn't think of a more relevant text. And so I simply got up and I read Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And it got a little quieter in the room, but it also got kind of nervous and awkward. And I wasn't sure everyone heard it, so I read it again. <laughs> marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And I started getting more dirty looks, and it got even quieter, so I thought, I'm sure I need to read this one more time. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, indeed, not one of us comes away clean or innocent before your, the mirror 
of your holy law. Every one of the Ten Commandments. They leave us shattered. They leave us weary and heavy laden, as it were, without Christ. They burden us rightly with condemnation and guilt and a desperate craving for rest. They, the needle of the law has to pierce us before the scarlet thread of the gospel can come in. The, the salt of the law makes us thirsty so that we might drink the living water of the gospel. The, the law is our schoolmaster and our tutor and our pedagogue to drive us to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so indeed, we confess, O oh Lord, all of us at heart are adulterers. We are idolaters. We do not worship the right God in the right way and honor your name and your day and our worship priorities as we ought. We dishonor the authorities you put over us. We are murderers and adulterers and as we'll see next time, thieves at heart. The very kind of thieves that Jesus died for and the one who he saved there in his final breaths. We thank you that Jesus, our Savior and Lord, died for lawbreakers, died for adulterers, and can rescue the most broken marriage, and can, where sin abounds, your grace can much more abound, as your word promises us, so that where sin reigned in death, so your grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we thank you. As we sang earlier, our sins are many, but your mercy is more. Until sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. We praise you for how your law humbles us. You are opposed to the proud, but you give grace to the humble. A broken and contrite spirit. David says there in his great psalm of confession, a broken and contrite spirit you will not despise, O Lord. Be merciful. God, be merciful to me. Thank you for your abundant grace. Thank you for your mercy poured out for sinners. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The, the righteous for the unrighteous. The godly for the ungodly. To reconcile, to bring us to you. We pray that in that same power of your grace that saves us, you would sanctify us. You would purify us. You would protect and strengthen our marriages and make us as Christians and as a church a, a bastion of uh, uh, defending marriage and a, a lighthouse and a pillar in support of the truth as we are required to be in your word for the upholding of the purity and sanctity of marriage in an anti-marriage uh, age that is assaulting and uh, ravaging and seeking to dismantle and destroy marriage on every front. Lord, keep us faithful. In your strength, by your grace, by your spirit, that many troubled marriages would find hope in Christ, would find healing in the gospel, and that we would raise up the next generation to shine brightly for Christ, to display Christ in the church in this most fundamental of all human relationships, the building block of all of society in the institution of marriage before a godless and a watching world, a lost and perishing world, that Christ came to save. In his saving name we pray. Amen. Amen.